having worked both in the public and the private sectors. Currently, he's the uh, director group HR, General Steel and Power Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, I would request all of you to please welcome him up on stage with a big hand. A uh, very good morning to all of you, most beautiful ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pure delight to be in a program which talks about skilling and talent gap being filled. But the context of today is very interesting. And I think it's more important for us actually to discuss about when we talk about skill and talent, to understand what do we mean by a skill and talent, which is the talent which is relevant today and contextual, and remove certain myths from our minds or mindset about the way this skill gap can be filled in. Let's go back to a few years from now. And 1998 reminds me of the year when globalization was the business driver and uh, Y2K bug was the technology driver. Well, uh, globalization meant a lot of things to everybody. And uh, so was the technology bug of Y2K. But Y2K bug was overcome. And as a result of this Y2K bug, what happened was that there was an overkill of technology that was generated. And that has actually built the context of today. And as Anurag was rightly saying, linear extrapolation died its death. Now that is very important because whenever we discuss, and particularly in the midst of academic, academicians, when we are talking about, it's very relevant for us to understand that the left part of the brain, the logical brain, the kind of you know, brain which is uh, driven by uh, reason, which is driven by cold logic, I mean, it could be of a different kind, but the point is that the right part of the brain becomes more relevant today. When the pace of technology is changing at the pace at which it is changing today. What happened and what happens today, and it's very relevant for us to discuss about industry when we talk about technology, when we talk about academics, how it can understand the undercurrents, the context. Unless we do that, we will not be able to prescribe the right kind of steps that need to be taken, which need to be taken anyways. So friends, what happened was that this technology overkill can be understood if I just give you a few examples. Go back to 2000, and as this lady mentioned actually, that there are a lot of youngsters. And incidentally, youngsters are all digital natives. We people who are above 40 and 50 are digital immigrants. It is we who are sharing this space and, and we kind of, you know, give postulations about what they should be doing, what should be prescribed, what should be proscribed. Gone are the days that this would be relevant anymore. Not that it was ever relevant. At any stage, at any point of time, no generation which was born later had, had that kind of scant respect for those who were there before them. They had to understand, they had to subscribe to their ways or ways of looking at things. That's a different issue. What happened was that internet of 2000 changed to web 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 by just 2008. The ERPs, which are still state-of-the-art technologies, SAP, JD Edwards, PeopleSoft, they became business performance platforms by 2008 and looked static and sterile when compared to the dynamic nature of BPPs. And this happened within the next eight years from 2000. That is very relevant, friends, for us to understand. And uh, all the academicians around here need to understand that what happened was not only happening in industry, because it was giving us a message that the business driver by 2008 had changed. For 5,000 years of human history, we have been starting with this discovery of fire, with the invention of the wheel, the steam engine, and that started the first industrial revolution in the modern sense. But then the pace of change and pace of change of technology changes, and that is what is driving skill at a particular level of time. At a given point of time, skill is related to the technology of that particular era, of that particular time. And as then we can see that the technology overkill that is created in the last eight years has changed the pace, the lifespan of a technology. The shelf life of technology is very short. But what is even shorter is the shelf life of an idea. Now that is where academics get into. When shelf life of an idea is too short, 
the prescription, the text that we write, the engineering that we write, the management postulates that we write, they become redundant the day and the moment they are created. Now that is very relevant and therefore we talk about the, the people getting unemployable. It's absolutely an absurdity. How can a student who has just been taught the discipline become absolutely unemployable and irrelevant to the context unless the text that he has been taught, what he has been taught is absolutely not related to the reality or has not been contextualized. And therefore, when you talk about industry and academic interface, it's something of an oxymoron. It's something which is stating the obvious. It has to be. One has to supplement the other. But the point is that change is taking place at a pace where it is continual change, which means change is no longer taking place over a period of time. Imagine, between the invention of the wheel and the, the discovery of fire, there was some, must have been thousands and thousands of years difference. Between the wheel and the steam engine, another few thousands and thousands of years. But from the steam engine, the pace of change changed. And to the extent that now continual change, change taking place at every given point of time, is become relevant. And therefore, academics and the industry has to respond. And they have to respond in reaction time. And that is the cause of mismatch. Because today, the industry doesn't know what it needs. Because the moment it understands what it needs, the need changes. And I'm not overstating. I'm not being overambitious and saying that out of my exuberance, out of my passion, I'm trying to say, build a future that doesn't exist. No. The pace of change is that fast. We are moving from <coughs> what was good enough for the first industrial revolution driven by steam, the second, 100 years later, by electricity, the third, by electronics and comu compu computers and telecommunication, is no longer the world that we are living in today. We are living in the fourth industrial revolution. And the fourth industrial revolution is what? It is basically a convergence of the cyberspace, the physical space, and ultimately the biospace, because genetics, genetic engineering is, is going to be the frontier technology. We are moving from a fossil fuel-based technology-driven environment to a defossilized world, which would not be actually looking at the renewable sources or non-renewable sources differently, but the only source of relevance would become something which is non, which is absolutely renewable source of energy for meeting our energy needs. Now, defossilization is a very advanced technology because it can range from not only wind, solar, which they say ocean, geothermal, and so on and so forth, but strangely enough, getting something from the moon, helium-3. People have started talking, Mr. Musk and Naveen Jain in Indian have started talking about getting helium-3 from the moon, and mind you, helium-3 would be a clean, non-invasive source of energy for entire mankind for millions of years. That is going to happen, and they say that is going to happen in the next 10, 15 years. Now, that is something which we have to absolutely keep in mind. And when these seminars take place, when these panel discussions will take place, I would like you all to be mindful of the fact that unless and until you discuss as to why and how will you be able to catch up with this gap that will suddenly come. The norms are changing. Our ways to deal with them are changing. And when I said respond in reaction time, that is what academics and the industry has to do. They have to understand that unless and until they are unlearning as much as they are learning and unlearning the right space and therefore youngsters sitting there are at an advantage because you people have to unlearn less than all of us. This is the relevance of today's modern technology. Because times, in fact, where the relevance of what I call the digital natives would be absolutely relevant and the demographic dividend that is going to be paid has to be very real because this is the tapping source of energy. This part of our uh, population will have to be really driven by the values which would be relevant today. So therefore, we have to unlearn a lot of stuff. So it's nothing that something of an FWA kind which is just born a year back, there's no disadvantage because that's the right time to be born in. You have less of 
mental burden. You are not carrying that baggage. You have to unlearn less. So therefore, in this current context, the one who will be in advantage would be the one who has to unlearn less. You have to travel light with no mental baggage. And therefore, when I was asked that I should deliver this talk on the gap between talent and skill, I said, let's understand the context today. We are talking of talent and skill in a context which is continual change being the business driver. And the relevance of any point or point of view is, is as short-lived as the moment. And this is going to become very real. Imagine, if you go to helium and get to helium-3 and through the cold fusion process which is just around the corner, a ton of helium-3 and which is in millions of tons available on the moon's surface, all that you have to do is to create a 600 degree temperature on the moon's surface and you can get it delivered in a can. And there are possibilities. I mean, there's nobody questioning that you can't go to the moon and get helium-3. If you are able to do, one ton of helium-3 is good enough to serve the energy needs of the United States of America for one full year. Which means what? At least one third of the cost of 13 to 12 trillion dollar economy, which means almost 2 to 3 trillion dollars worth. So it's economical, it's viable. So just imagine how the world changes. Has our academics been able to incorporate the changes that are there? The frontier science, the frontier technology, the frontier methodologies? And we keep discussing in seminars that yes, we talk about still about the industry academics interface being relevant and has to supplement each other. No, it's not only to supplement, it's absolutely redundant to talk about this, this is obvious. It has to be, unless they support each other. The relevance is lost. You are doing a thing just like you know you do more and more of what you used to do in the past. If you continue to do what happens, you get into a state of an active inertia, which means you do a lot of stuff. You think you're doing a lot, but then like a treadmill, you will not be moving forward. You'll sweat a lot, you'll maybe lose weight, but then you're not moving forward. So therefore, the relevance of, of this context would be that we have to think afresh, right part of the brain, the parallel, parallel thinking, thinking process, process creativity, creativity, and, and this, this has, has to be engendered into our academic, academic system and methodology. methodology. We, we talk, talk about, about the West in, the, in, in India. India. When, when the, the West, West 1970s, 1970s, yes, they have talked about, they started talking, talking about interface of industry and academics long, long since then, and there are a lot of institutions which are doing the same in India as well. But the point is, they're just not doing enough. Because, because interface, interface in itself is not important, what's important is what should change in that interface. What is not the format of it, but the substantive part of it. If we continue to lean on the left part of the brain, the logical brain, inductive and deductive logic will not lead us to new innovation and entrepreneurial culture that Anurag talked about. And that is going to be of relevance today. Because skill in numbers are humongous, that's required. Imagine 65% of the Indian population would be under 35. What kind of a message that we are passing on? What is it that we are trying to do to level the skill gap? Because skill is not just, you know, something which is manual. Skill consists of equations between intellect, emotion, spirituality and physicality. And competence or talent which we call is a combination of not only skill but knowledge, attitude and now I call the fourth dimension called values. So therefore, this is a very key messaging that, that I'm trying to put across. That skill is something which is a combination of a lot of things which are relevant to the context. And therefore, skill related to and democratization of you know, society, democratization of industry, the participative culture, the kind of you know, inclusiveness that is going to come, diversity management, which will be very relevant. So therefore, the work order of the future the nature of work, the workmen, you know, their, their kind of, you know, personalities, their persona, their delineations would be very different. So, so if we, we continue, continue to think of the future workforce, workforce the, the demographic, demographic that content that we'll have in the lens, lens of the present, present that will be absolutely irrelevant. irrelevant. We, we will not be leading anywhere. anywhere. So, so therefore, therefore, I thought, thought and that's the thought, thought Anurag, you triggered in my mind, mind that let, let me first talk, talk about this context before even I talk, talk about what is skill and talent and what is the gap and how this gap has to be fulfilled. 
So, so having understood that, that design, design thinking, thinking would be the way out, out the world, world would be very different because it's no longer problem solving where you know a lot. You know the paradigm that will change and you can kind of, you know, uh, arrange for handling those. We have moved, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, from the world of probability to the world of possibility today. That world of probability held us good. When we had our academics, you know, drawn out the textbooks and they would remain relevant for 10, 15, 20 years. In today's context of the world of possibility driven by the disruptive technology that we created where artificial intelligence, 3D printing, you call it machine learning, you call cognitive learning with the computers and the kind of, you know, robots, robots, boards and cohorts when you interact with, with the human beings. That's the kind of technology you'll have to deal with. The very relevance of, you know, things being known absolutely becomes insignificant. We are dealing, dear friends, with things which are more unknown. And theory of probability does not help us to manage unknowns. The predictability of an unpredictable world will become an issue. And we are too sure and we all the time kind of, you know, be more comfortable with predicting and be having that predictive capability. We don't have. To say that I don't know would be about virtue than saying that I know. That is the kind of mindset change that is in the world of possibility because here the world will not be a problem. It will be a mystery to be solved. So the kind of skill that we have to develop in our students, those 65% of our population, and Anurag said not conventional ways of teaching. They can't just do. They are incapable of handling this huge, you know, gargantuan proportion of the magnitude and the complexity of the problem that lies ahead. We have to find unconventional ways of communicating to this 65% of our population very, very differently, have to develop what you call the mystery-solving attitude. You have to become a Columbus. And when you solve a mystery, you don't know what would you be facing, what will be the challenges, but you are just having that courage. You have some bit of, you know, intuition. You have to redefine the very algorithm of the way you think. Now, there lies the solution, probably. Redefine the very algorithm of life. The way you think, the way you do, the way you act, the way you respond. And the way we have been conventionally taught to respond. Because imagine this is the fourth industrial revolution where it's all about convergence of the cyberspace, the physical space, as well as what you call the biosphere. So friends, it's a very, very different, brave new world. Design thinking is then the order of the day. And through these design engineered, human engineering would become relevant for us if we have to bridge the skill and talent gap. People may say that, you know, brick and mortar industry will exist, masonry, plumbing. Who is going to teach them? The point is that plumbing and, and the kind of masonry would be of a very, very different order. Today we talk about building construction in of almost about a Burj Khalifa in less than three months. There is a technology using 3D printing that is available. It can build a Burj Khalifa in just less than three months. So what would be the plumbing and masonry of that kind? It will be very different, sir. So now the democratization of education, the very right side usage of brain, the design thinking would be relevant as much for whom we call today unskilled labor and the CEO of a company. The democratization will flatten the world order, it will flatten the organization structure, that whole hierarchical concept will go away, has to go away if we have to manage the world of the future. So friends, I think we already delayed our schedule, I won't be taking too long, but before I end, I thought that I would just, you know, I changed the context what I came prepared with, but when Anurag said, and I heard you all in the inaugural session, I wish, in fact, I request all of you not to be talking about the conventional ways of this is, this is, this, what we have to do. We have to devise a methodology where we have to skip a lot of things. How do we deal with what you call the digital natives who were born with that kind of post-1985? All those, that will be a very, very different world. And this world of today has to be explored as a mystery. So design thinking principles, which have some bit of heuristics, some bit of science. The only relevant competence, as they say, because competence, as I said, you can describe or define it, whatever way you call it, as skill, knowledge, and attitude, which is very conventional. But what's important is 
The real talent will be with the right values. And the values would be of adapting, upgrading, modifying, and changing yourself every moment. That alone would be defining the future of tomorrow. And a future that has already arrived. So that's the way we have to start looking at life. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. So I'd request you to please stay back on the stage for a moment. So one moment. Uh, I would request Professor Mahesh Gandhi, President of WA, along with Dr. Irfan Ray Rizvi, Vice President of WA, to please come on the stage. So it's a small honor on behalf of FWA for being the lead speaker in the industry session. I would request Dr. Rizvi, along with uh, Professor Gandhi, to come on the stage for the citation. Can we have the citation, please? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I would request all of you to please put your hands together for Mr. Rajiv Bhadoria.